I'm Janine Marshall. I'm the Student Services uh, Coordinator for Mi'kmaq and Anbanui. Uh, and the program that uh, we're working on in collaboration with our communities is yoga and school and mindfulness, which we've uh, which we've called Jenny Dawson. We're unique in the situation in Nova Scotia that uh, Yoga 11, for example, is uh, an accredited course uh, in high school. And um, so we've, we've worked for the past five years to train uh, multiple cohorts of teachers that can deliver the curriculum. Um, and some of them are presently teaching yoga 11 and some of them are teaching other grades so really um, we have yoga teachers yoga teachers certified rather um, in I think our youngest yoga teacher or youngest grade rather that they're delivering programs is uh, grade 3 um, so grade 3 to grade 12 really um, but uh, having said that um, We'll be working probably this fall to train another cohort of, uh, you know, K to K to three teachers and that sort of thing. It's uh, it really is dependent on on funding and our board of directors and what uh, pilot projects they're able to approve and phases and that sort of thing. Um, so we we have uh, we have trained teachers that are um, delivering Yoga Eleven curriculum. And then uh, we have other teachers that are delivering yoga within their context, so learning centers, uh, regular classrooms, that sort of thing. Um, the mindfulness curriculum that we're creating is primarily for, uh, at this point, it's primarily for grades seven and eight. And uh, it's still in development phase. Uh, we've partnered with the Department of Nova Scotia uh, Education and really it's uh, it, it'll probably grow again like much like yoga did um, or is and um, I, I can't really say specifically what age it's for because even though it's contingent on grade 7 and 8 uh, outcomes or indicators in the curriculum in the province it um, it has the capacity to be used uh, in other grades as well. So what we're seeing in our community of schools is we're seeing a lot more and more of our children uh, dysregulated in a lot of ways, um, whether they have experienced uh, effects of trauma, whether they're just detached culturally and linguistically, we're just seeing a lot of uh, dysregulation uh, manifest itself in behavior. and. Um, what I'd like to hope that the program is is doing and what we've seen with yoga in schools, uh, in our schools, in our MK family of schools, is we're helping kids to find the calm within the storm. Uh, so being a young person in 2019 is a heck of a lot harder than it was when I was their age. Um, it'll be even harder in the generations to come in terms of navigating what it is to be an indigenous person in, in this country um, and how to retain uh, who you are and where you come from without all the extraneous distractions. You know, it's tough. Um, so really that's the aim of the program is to help them find that calm within their storm, uh, one breath, one posture, one lesson at a time. Retention of teachers. Um, you know, we we invest. Uh, we have invested a pretty significant amount of uh, resources collectively in training teachers. Uh, each cohort or each teacher that has taken yoga teacher training in in Nova Scotia, it's 200 hours of training, and it doesn't come at a cheap at a cheap price tag. Unfortunately, what's happened is it's challenging to retain all of those trained teachers uh, to keep teaching in our family of schools when we're competing, in some cases, uh, with provincial pay scales that may not be reflective of, uh, you know, or may not be as equitable as First Nations pay scales. I think no matter what program you're creating, you always have to have the idea in education that you're just the conduit to plant a seed, that 
um, the work of one program is not the work of one singular person. Uh, the work of keep teaching kids regulation and, and balance and pride doesn't just come from one foot one person. It comes from um, it comes from taking that seed and putting it in an environment that it'll grow and nurture, be nurtured, and that it's grown and nurtured by teachers that believe in yogic philosophy, that believe in the strength that comes from being indigenous, that harnesses the wisdom and the guidance from our elders and our environment and our land, and believes in the in the in the process of what that seed can become um, so you know oftentimes programs are created and they're created in the context that we're comparing our model with something else somebody else has done so to really own the process and make it a truly migma process um, of developing our own curriculum of of looking at what the provincial guidelines are in terms of curriculum and outcomes and indicators and then what that actually means in a classroom and in our context. It's a bit different. Um, we, haven't, uh, we haven't relied on other models. We've uniquely created our own and our own framework and our own mindset on it because, um, you know, people here on the East Coast have been extremely resilient and to be able to put that resiliency skill set in uh, in lessons in content in in the multiple forms that it'll take um, has been a unique unique process and um, it's it's not the process or the way that I had envisioned it happening um, but it's it's become uniquely Mi'kma and something that um, I'm very proud of. I've had a lot of advisors that have said, you know, put your name on this and you created this and you're the conduit for making this happen and all that. I'm just the vessel. I'm just the vessel that holds it or helps facilitate it. Um, where the lessons have come from, I never could have predicted. I never could have predicted that a story that I heard when I was seven years old, the very first time on reserve, would ever would ever guide a visual framework and a diagram to, uh, to teach children that them being Mi'kmaq is amazing. Um, you know, I was just nourished by an elder at seven and um, at a very uh, pivotal time in my life where family and home was tough. And uh, I, I never, never would have thought where it would grow into um, or that it would become a model. Um, and, you know, you hear so many stories of elders saying that it's always been there. It's, it's always been right in front of you. Everything you need is right in front of you. And it literally was. Um, so to take those gifts and to uh, utilize them in a way that uh, teaches children to to meditate, to find that calm within the storm of their lives, of being indigenous, of, uh, you know, trying to reclaim their, what was taken, to re-identify with their language, all of those things are, are critical. Um, so, you know, I guess the best thing I can say is that uh, one never knows what grows out of untended seeds. And, you know, here on the East Coast, our people and our communities and our elders um, it's it's been all there right in front of us um, but it's up to us to take the time and, and develop it and share the story and share the process so much of uh, curriculum is not about literacy and numeracy it's what is beyond the curriculum or the scope of curriculum and how one connects to something within themselves that makes them a better person to give back to the next generation. And that's a uniquely Indigenous perspective. You know, in, in Western knowledge, 
here's your indicators, here's how you measure success, here's your performance, here's this. To me, how I measure the success of Jenny Dawsink and yoga in schools is when I have former students that were in Yoga 11 or have been part of helping develop this process. Um, and uh, they're not hanging on a rope. Um, I speak to a lot of a lot of teachers um, in the public school system, and I don't think um, nearly as many of them have lost as many students as I have. And um, you know, curriculum is important. But if that young person doesn't find their spirit and find their voice, what are they going to do in life? Um, it's about teaching them that they are part of uh, their nation, they are valued, they are needed, and they have a purpose. Um, whether or not that means they have a job in some cases where they might not have felt that they were qualified to, to go out and seek that job. Uh, whether it means they go into uh, an area of employment or education that they themselves wouldn't have seen themselves go into prior. Um, and I don't necessarily know if it would all be, uh, all be the result of yoga and mindfulness, but what I've heard from students um, that are going through the, the rigorous stress of, you know, academic curriculum that have the time to, or make the time rather, to take Yoga 11 as an example. Um, they've, it, they've developed a level of resiliency that they see the challenges in front of them, they know the obstacles that they face as an Indigenous person, as a Mi'kmaq person, and they persevere and they push through it. Um, you know, so my hope and my measurement of success is that I won't have another fall that I'm going to as many wakes and funerals as I did this fall. Um, and when we see those patterns and when we see that, that unhealthiness manifest in our people, what do we do collectively to rally, to support, to ensure a brighter future for them? So there's lots of indicators, um, but really, you know, healthy, active living and, and movement and uh, yoga, mindfulness, meditation, all of those things are connected in wellness um, and, you know, rekindling and reconnecting to spirit and their environment, um, to me, is a measure of success. When our youth know how to go out in community and speak to an elder, that's a measure of success. When they know the protocol in an environment that a ceremony is taking place, that's a level of success that, to me, can't necessarily be measured by mainstream curriculum, but it really speaks volumes for the individual, the type of individuals that they're going to become in their lives. Find, uh, find the funding that's going to allow uh, the continued collective voice to come forward. Um, I never could have done this without other teachers that were like-minded and said, you know what, we're not, doing en we're not doing enough of the right things to give kids value in the classroom or make them feel valued or let them know that it's okay, that they're not feeling uh, imbalanced with everything. Um, you know, so for, for lack of, uh, you know, I, I hate corny puns, but really it's about finding your tribe. And what I mean by that is it's about taking an idea and finding other people that are similar in their thinking, but maybe make it happen in their classrooms or in their context a little bit differently and pooling those people together so that when you do develop your lessons and the process and you're defining what that process looks like for your nation, um, 
it's uniquely reflective of collective voices. So it's reflective of voices of youth, of teachers, of administrators, of elders, uh, and even leaders, if you can find leaders that are yogis themselves. Um, I never thought that I would be in a room where I would get some of our traditional leaders to um, uh, to be doing yoga poses, uh, to be taking a mindful break, uh, to be sharing what they internalize mindfulness is, um, and it's uh, it's been an interesting process. Like, and and know that the process is going to take a lot of time. Um, I ambitiously thought that we would have polished lessons and you know a curriculum guide and all of this stuff. Um, and it's nowhere near where I hoped it would be. Um, but the process has been uh, uniquely reflective of, of us as Mi'kmaq people. It's messy, uh, it's dirty work. Um, you know, there's, there's a saying in, in yoga that uh, we have issues in our tissues. Well, as an indigenous person, you have hundreds of years of issues in your tissues. So be prepared for the mess that comes out um, be prepared for uh, hitting students' nerves um, and build a network of, of yoga teachers as an example or mindfulness teachers as an example so that you have that network of support when, when tough things have come up with students um, because it, uh, it can get messy and uh, it is emotional and, um, you know, you never know sometimes where you're going to trigger students. Um, and when you do trigger students, man, you feel like crap. Um, but then it allows them to grow and it allows you to learn and it allows you to support and, and all of that. Um, so it's a completely different take on curriculum. Um, but it is really building that capacity of sharing and caring and, and kids knowing that they're validated and, and where they're coming from and where they're at in their lives. Um, and it, it's frustrating for them too because they're all zen out in yoga and meditation and then they go back to the classroom, right? So teaching them that, that resiliency piece as well of how to go back and forth. Um, and it is so symbolic because, you know, even as an Indigenous person, you are constantly bombarded by um, non-mainstream, like mainstream culture and society and, and how do you relate and how do you retain your identity in that context. I'm hoping that uh, within the next year or so, um, there will be uh, the polished you know, guide, if you will, uh, for, you know, and again, it, it's, it's a model that works in Nova Scotia. Um, so it's a model that will be linked to, uh, grade seven and eight curriculum, um, in a provincial system. Um, but it'll also be a curriculum that will be connected with, uh, uniquely Mi'kmaq concepts and, and ways of knowing. And it'll also be something that is grounded in, uh, evidence-based practices with other links to other researchers' work, um, you know, so we're, we're helping to validate the work of Kelly Mahler and interoception, and we're helping to validate, um, you know, the fact that teach principles and, and structured environment and all of those things can work in, in a context like that. Um, you know, so I'm hoping that, uh, you know, mainstream society will, will learn from us as well as, as we've learned from them. Like we've had to take evidence-based practices and, and make them, make them our own. And what does that look like? And, you know, so that, that defines a whole another level of, uh, layers of research that, you know, need to be done and documented. Indigenous education to me is, uh, you know, it's, um, it's, uh, it's about honoring first voice. You know, it's, it's about looking in your environment and uh, seeing who your first teachers are. Who were your first teachers? What did they teach you? Where did they teach you? How did they teach you? Um, when you failed, when you fell flat on your face, they might have pointed at you and laughed, but how did they help you get back up again? And 
as they were helping you get up, um, what were the supports that they put in place so that the next time you tried again, you were successful? Um, you know, so many, so much of our history has been about what's taken from us, but not enough of our history is about what still remains. And we still remain. And there's a reason why we're here. And there's a reason why we've adapted and we've evolved and we've become stronger. And it's about time that we celebrate that, that we uh, share good practices and what best practices look like for us in our context on the East Coast, uh, in the middle of the country, West Coast, wherever our context is, what does best practice look like for you? And it's about seeing the smiles and the love from the children that are in front of us every day. Um, I never would have thought of this. I never would have thought of bringing yoga in schools if I didn't have the experience of being an educator in community and supporting our, our learners in community and seeing them struggle and watching me improve my practice as an educator and watching myself fail and getting back up again and learning again and trying again. You know, so it's, it's that constant recycling or process, if you will, of, you know, try something, uh, you know, take a step back, improve it, all of that. It's that give and take, um, you know, and, and not being afraid to, uh, to put yourself out there as an educator, um, to be that goofy teacher that is completely saying where it's wrong in Mi'kmaq because you grew up off reserve. Um, and, uh, and constantly showing that, you know, learning is a lifelong process, uh, and embracing that, you know, what I know at 42, what I will know at 93, and I can say 93 because I have grandmothers that are 90, um, and they're still learning. And, you know, to, to teach our kids that, you know, what we learn from K to 12 is one thing, but what we learn in the span of our lifetime is immense and it's rich and it's beautiful. And if it's embedded in our culture and our language uh, with the voice of first teachers, it's uh, remarkably impressive and they become remarkable human beings. I would love to see a funding model that is not just about equity but uh, or parity in the country. I would love to see a funding model that recognizes uh, Canada's history of colonization and what it has done to hundreds of years of our people. And instead of it just being about equity or parity, that it really becomes about enhancement because the only way that this world is truly going to be a better place uh, is if all peoples listen to indigenous peoples as this environment um, is ours and we are the keepers of it and we know what works best for it. And all along throughout this history of colonization, we have known what works best for our kids and works best for our peoples uh, to really have the opportunity to not only give them equal platforming of, you know, lunches and schools and, um, you know, better roads and buses and all of those things that make education happen, but really about giving them a better road, a better path, so that they can come back and help transform everything you know um, I hope to see better funding in my lifetime um, I look at the complexities of what our communities face in terms of trying to meet learning needs and it's hard there's not nearly enough funding